I'm Dr. Stephen Ross. I'm an addiction psychiatrist at the NYU School of Medicine at Bellevue Hospital, and I'm a psychedelic researcher. When I was 14 years old, my mom invited me to accompany her uh, to a hospice that she was volunteering. This was in the mid-80s in Los Angeles, and this was one of the first hospices in Los Angeles, and my mom, being the beautiful person that she is, volunteered to go to hospice. When she asked me to go, I jumped at the opportunity. I had wanted to be a doctor since I was age six, and I thought this would be a really interesting opportunity. And so for a couple of years, I went on, on a bunch of occasions to this hospice in the Valley in Los Angeles, and it was really a life-changing experience for me. What I got to witness at this hospice setting were uh, people having good deaths. They were surrounded by friends and family members. Uh, they were not getting chemo uh, or any treatment anymore for their cancer. The staff was helping them deal with existential problems in their life, and they were happy. They were smiling. And at the end of this process, people had these really amazing experiences where they would die with family members, friends, and hospice workers in the room. And it was incredibly moving and an amazing experience. Fast forward to my medical training. Over a decade of, of training, I was a medical student at UCLA. I did my general psychiatry training at Columbia, and I did my addiction training at NYU Bellevue. Um, and I got something completely different during uh, my experience in medicine. I saw the opposite of good deaths. I saw bad deaths. I was very interested in oncology and spent a lot of time on the cancer wards, in particular as a medical student in my fourth year and then as an intern. Uh, I spent about four months on an inpatient oncology ward. And what I saw here were, were bad deaths, patients that were separated from their families, ter terrorized and, and terrified that they were dying of the disease process, and they were continuing to get chemotherapy up until the very end. Um, and the doctors never step back to say, hey, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Should we be thinking about this in a different way? Um, and I don't blame the doctors. It was a, a kind of lacunae in medical training that they did not train doctors in palliative care. It's gotten better over time, but when I was a trainee, I don't remember getting any courses on palliative care. There was nothing about how to think about help somebody who's dying and how to increase psychological, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Doctors are trained to save lives and to, and to never give up. So that was like in our DNA and that's what we did, but it, it really was not helping the patients and, and it was um, really interesting how different it, it was compared to this hospice experience that I had with, with my mom. So now fast forward to 2006. Um, I've been at Bellevue and NYU six years. I'm running the substance abuse division. It's an administrative role. I have a teaching role. And one of my supervisors, Jeff Gus, starts talking to me about LSD. And, uh, and I got really curious. I, why, why is he mentioning LSD? He said he was going to Switzerland to commemorate the uh, birthday of Albert Hoffman. And I, I, I thought, why would anyone commemorate Albert Hoffman? Like, what, what did he do exactly? And Jeff said, well, he was the inventor of LSD. And I think it was a big part of psychiatry. You should really check it out. So. I was curious and I started to check it out and, and kind of like it blew me away, hidden in plain sight and completely absented from any of my training was this huge body of research from the 40s to the 70s. Um, it was kind of like the first wave of psychedelic research and it was a huge part of psychiatry. There were over 40,000 research participants studied and what piqued my interest is the most studied and promising indication by far was the use of LSD treatment, LSD-assisted psychotherapy for alcohol use disorder. And being an addiction psychiatrist, that really got my interest. But I also learned that the second most studied and promising indication was the use of psychedelics, essentially LSD-assisted psychotherapy, to help terminally ill cancer patients that were having anxiety, depression, and existential distress. Um, and I, I got really interested in this body of, of research. Uh, and the more I looked, the more interested I got in it. And in thinking of the history, there were two great research programs in this area. The first was this amazing psychiatrist that I'd never heard of named Eric Kast. He was a pain researcher. And he heard about LSD um, in the 50s and not knowing anything about its unique psychological effects, decided to order some up got LSD from Sandoz and decided that he's going to test it to treat pain 
in end-of-life cancer patients who were dying on an inpatient ward at the University of Chicago. Um, and what he found was remarkable. He was a great scientist, so his first study was a comparative efficacy study of single-dose LSD versus two opioids. And what he found is that LSD um, led to rapid reductions in pain within the first several hours that persisted for three weeks after one dose. And that was really interesting to him. But even more interesting than that, patients started to talk about having these profound philosophical insights and mystical experiences. And a lot of them said they're no longer scared to die. He called this a kind of pe peculiar disregard for death, that they were not traumatized by dying anymore, that they had accepted it. And he also reported decreased depression and anxiety. Um, CAST went on to do this in 200 people. So that work led to um, the kind of dream team of psychedelic research in the 60s. This was at Spring Grove. And they included Stan Groff, Walter Pankey, Bill Richards, who's still doing psychedelic research at Hopkins. They initially were going to study psychedelics to treat alcoholism, but one of the nurses developed um, metastatic breast cancer and was dying. And they decided to completely repurpose their research to study an LSD-assisted psychotherapy to help dying cancer patients. And they ended up treating about 70 individuals, all terminal cancer. This was in an outpatient setting. And here it was the model of two therapists, preparation before eight hour, or with LSD longer, 12 hour dosing days, and integration afterwards. And they found similar findings to CAST. Decreases in depression, anxiety, decreased fear of death were the main findings. So this set the stage for the next phase, which was going to be randomized controlled trials in this area. But before that could happen, the music came to an abrupt stop, that the drug psychedelics had escaped from the lab in the 60s, and they quickly went from wonder drugs that were going to transform psychiatry into demonic drugs, that there were bad outcomes that started to happen, people using them in uncontrolled settings. Um, and they spilled into the counterculture and became a kind of threat to the political establishment at the time. We were at war in Vietnam. And ultimately, Richard Nixon declared Timothy Leary the most dangerous man in America and said, we, we need to put a stop to this. So the war on drugs was declared uh, essentially against these drugs and what they were doing. Uh, and in 1970, Congress enacted the Controlled Substance Act which really as an addiction psychiatrist has been a horrible thing. It has led to addiction being criminalized. It's led to us being the biggest jailer in the world. And we take a neurologic illness and we put people in jail uh, and punish them for it, which is really bad. So back to 2006, I'm having this meeting with Jeff Gus. Suddenly I'm like interested in psychedelics, had never thought about it. And very quickly, Jeff Gus, Tony Bossis and myself formed the NYU Psychedelic Research Group. In fact, we were a reading group at first. We didn't know what we were going to do. We didn't think research was possible, but I was introduced to Charlie Grobe. He was completing a trial of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy, a small pilot trial in patients with terminal cancer that had depression, anxiety, and existential distress. His daughter was an NYU student, and he said, why don't you do this at NYU? So kind of out of nowhere, decided to do a trial which took about 10 years to do. And what was really amazing about this trial is it reconnected me back to these early experiences I had with my mom in the hospice. The whole point of the trial was to help dying people face death with dignity and to have increased psychological, emotional, and spiritual well-being. So I, I loved the idea of, of doing that. Um, but I was scared. I was scared giving psilocybin to people who were very anxious, who were dying, that had cancer. I was worried they would have terrible experiences. But after about half of the participants were treated, about half of the 30 or so, um, I started to think there must be something wrong, that people must be making up that they have cancer, making up symptoms, because everyone kept describing very rapidly by the end of the day feeling so much better, that their depression had melted away, their anxiety had melted away, and they just felt so much better. And I started to think there's, there's really maybe something going on here. And when we finished the study and analyzed it, the data bore that out. We found that psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy in patients with advanced cancer, depression, anxiety, and existential distress produced re rapid reductions in depression. So for instance, one day after getting psilocybin, 80% of the participants that got psilocybin no longer met criteria for depression and cancer. They were rapidly acting anti-anxiety agents, which we saw 24 hours after. And the really astonishing thing is when we ran the experiment till the end at six and a half months, the, those improvements were sustained. 
So we found that a single dose of a medication led to rapid reductions in anxiety and depression that lasted at least six and a half months. We also found um, short-term reductions in existential distress, decreased demoralization, decreased hopelessness. We found improved quality of life. We found that the mystical experience um, in some ways mediated the therapeutic outcomes and that it suggested it might be a psychological mechanism of action. We did a long-term follow-up up to five years. About half of the participants were still alive. And in five years or so, uh, the participants continued to report sustained antidepressant and anxiolytic effects. It's very hard to say that that was due to the psilocybin, but qualitatively, almost all of them said, that experience changed my life, changed my orientation to cancer, and reconnected me to a meaningful life. And these drugs are meaning-making medications. They're, they're very unique in that way. So cancer is not the only advanced medical illness, and there's no reason to think psilocybin or psychedelics would only work in that population. So there are efforts now to go beyond cancer. For example, Charlie Grove and Tony Bossis are leading a multi-center trial, and NYU will be a site, using psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy to help people that have depression, anxiety, and existential distress in any end-of-life advanced illness um, beyond cancer. It can be end-stage heart disease, end-stage kidney disease, um, pulmonary disease. So that, that's a really interesting area uh, to continue, and we'll see what happens with that. In particular, we're looking for how these experiences create new meaning and help people who are stuck where they feel like life is no longer worth living, there's no more meaning, they're detached from sources of love, hope, connection, spirituality. Um, and, and my biggest sort of hope on the translational end of this, if it works, is I'm imagining cancer centers having a psilocybin dosing room that if you are sick and you're at a cancer center that, that this treatment would be available. But actually, it, it wouldn't be the first available treatment. I'd like to see medical education do a much better job of training physicians in general in, in end-of-life distress so that, um, so that we could have a very robust algorithm of care to detect existential and other kinds of distress in end-of-life and to provide a whole algorithm, including existential psychotherapies and other things before you'd get to psilocybin. But I, I think psilocybin would be a great tool in the armament. Um, and ultimately, I, I, this is getting back to my hospice experience, I would like to see these medications available. And so ha helping patients in hospice settings approach death with dignity, um, surrounded by family members, able to prepare for their death, able to still find meaning and live their lives fully, uh, and approach death with enhanced psychological, emotional, and spiritual well-being is extremely exciting to me, and I'm very hopeful that this is a treatment modality that really could help a lot of people in the future.